Fox News alert. New fallout over comments President Trump reportedly made during an Oval Office meeting on immigration yesterday. Now he's denying much of it and standing by his refusal to accept a deal that he believes would be bad for America. But at least one person who was in that room at the time says the president used language that was, quote, hate-filled, vile, and racist. End quote. We'll get into it. This is Outnumbered. I'm Harris Faulkner, here today, co-host of After the Bell on FBN, <laughs> Melissa Francis. The editor of townhall.com, Katie Pavlich, commentator and Fox News contributor, Rachel Campos Duffy. Glad you're here. And joining us today on the couch, Fox News political analyst and co-host of The Five, Juan Williams. And you are Outnumbered. I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> All right. You ready to get to the news? Absolutely. So much news on a foggy day in New York City. I know, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> we're finally thawing out. So it causes the fog. <laughs> so we're actually celebrating fog. Controversy over something President Trump reportedly said during a meeting on immigration in the Oval Office. Sources telling Fox News the president used vulgar language while questioning why the United States would accept immigrants from countries including Haiti and some African nations. Sources close to the president telling Fox News the president was making a case for accepting more highly skilled immigrants. But the reports prompting major backlash. Haitian American Republican Congresswoman Mia Love released a statement writing the reported remarks were quote unkind, divisive, elitist and fly in the face of our nation's values. This behavior is unacceptable from the leader of our nation, end quote. The president tweeted this. The language used by me at the DACA meeting was tough, but this was not the language used. What was really tough was the outlandish proposal made a big setback for DACA, end quote. And then he tweeted this. Never said anything derogatory about Haitians other than Haiti is obviously a very poor and troubled country. Democratic Senator Dick Durbin was in that meeting. He says the reports are accurate. To no surprise, the president started tweeting this morning denying that he used those words. It is not true. He said these hate-filled things, and he said them repeatedly. He said, Haitians, do we need more Haitians? And then he went on when we started to describe the immigration from Africa that was being protected in this uh, bipartisan measure. That's when he used these vile and vulgar comments calling the nations they come from holes. The exact word used by the president, not more, not just once, but repeatedly. And, of course, we bleep that salty word that was used by, uh, by the senator there. Your thoughts? Well, I, you know, I just don't know how anybody at this point can give any credibility to the denial. Yesterday, when the White House had every opportunity to deny the report, and they were given the information straight up, um, they refused to deny it, and in fact, Fox News confirmed it, uh, that the president had said this. So this morning he comes back and says he didn't say it. It just seems to me to compound the error that was made, and it, it's a very troubling one. I think everybody, you know, liberal or, Demo liberal or, or conservative, is resistant to come to any conclusion about the president or try to, you know, we don't need additional static. But when he you says don't things, need additional stuff. That's well, so true. it's not. I mean, it's so yeah. much. I mean, remember the start yeah. of this week, Melissa. We were arguing about whether or not he right. was fit and mentally competent to serve as president. Then he put the meeting on television to right. demonstrate. And now at the end of the week, we're arguing about. My God, what did he say? And how can he say that about human beings? The, the country may be in sh bad shape, but we as Americans have always taken in people yeah. who seek. To have to fulfill their dreams, their children's dreams in this country of opportunity. And here he is calling those people, not the country, by that vulgar term. Rachel? Well, first of all, my understanding of it was he was talking about the countries, those governments being not so great. Um, first of all, I don't agree with this term. I'm glad Mia Love put that out. Um, and, she, yeah. and I would too. I mean, her, she, sometimes the best immigrants come from those kind of countries, they're better able to see the difference between sure. what we're offering opportunity-wise versus those countries that are often corrupt and, and have, are dysfunctional. That said, I still have a problem with people in a private meeting going out and saying what the president said when they know, like right now, I just heard a report that said the Panamanian ambassador just quit over this. I mean, it makes our country look bad. I think the Democrats in this case should have used some discretion. And even if he did say that, maybe for the sake of the country, Can I ask not, you a question, though? not repeat mm, it. And I, and, and I understand what you're saying about the Democrats repeating this. There were Republicans in that room. We have confirmed that. Yeah, uh, I know. Senators Graham, Flake, 
cotton. And, uh, and so for them, let me finish, on, on a day in which the president just signed a proclamation uh -huh. honoring Dr. King, which was a beautiful moment, yeah. uh, on a day that he does that at the White House, it is complicated. Mm -hmm. It is a, a point of, of conflict, if you will, in your mind to try to hold both these thoughts. And that simply, if these men were there, and we know it's already leaked out and people are talking about it, where are their voices to either defend this They're president They're not defending, which means he or, probably said it. Or say he said it and this was the context and adding their context to it. But, where are those Republican voices? Uh, the fact that the Republicans that were in the room are not coming to his defense tells me that he probably said it. But here's what I will, I, I just want to say one thing. Again, I'm not defending the comments, but this is a 70-year-old man. He speaks in a certain way. It's very impolitic. It's very un-PC. Um, and, you know, who among us hasn't said an un-PC thing? I get it. I don't approve of it. But I don't understand why, for the sake of politics, you would, in a private meeting, go out and right. say All right, I, I want to jump in with this, said. though, because apparently the Panamanian uh, ambassador actually resigned 24 hours before these comments were made. Okay. Uh, Brett Baer has confirmed that for us. Thank you, Brett, first of all, for watching and also for getting in on the conversation <laughs> with the facts. Uh, the first diplomat to resign, um, he said it happened. It's uh, John Freely is his name, and so I just wanted to get that out there. Can, I mean, I want to address something that Juan said. First of all, I do think this has been the longest week of any of our lives. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, my <laughs> Couldn't goodness. Agree more. I mean, the ups, the, the whole week has been pretty much insane. I would answer his question, which is the reason why we want people from places that are a disaster is that these are the immigrants so often that appreciate being here the most and work the hardest once they're here and really understand the difference. And, and even as we take this conversation forward, and, and even if you try to advance it to, you know, is this the labor that we want coming into this country if the system is falling apart and people are perhaps less skilled and less educated? And I would say, you know, talk to people that run businesses and say that that when you have an immigrant worker, you know, they want immigration to be legal because these are the people who value these jobs and work very hard worth versus teenagers, you know, oftentimes who don't appreciate the minimum wage job. I mean, I think like we in addition, the language is is horrible, whether it's said or not. But the sentiment also needs to be corrected. All right. I, I want to uh, go to this uh, reporters after MLK Day dedication. Can we can we take a peek at that? Um, Maybe not. Mm. Uh, Mr. President, will you give an apology for the statement yesterday? Mr. President, did you refer to African Asians? Mr. President, are you a racist? Mr. President, will you respect the Asian American 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 respond to these serious questions about the statement, sir? No, Mr. President, I have to allow you to talk. Katie, you and I have been in scrums like that on different occasions, and, you know, people shout all sorts of things out, and uh, they're wild microphones, and you could hear much of what they were saying at and to the president. Yeah, the questions of, are you a racist? Did you say the, the word that we're not going to say here on, on the air? Yeah. Uh, the thing for me is, is the, there is a distinction between the people who live in a country and the governments that run it. Yahoo News interviewed a 30-year-old sociologist from Guinea, and she actually agrees with the president and ran through a whole long list of African countries that are corrupt in the way that they treat women and the societies that they run there. That that being said, the president has to realize that these kinds of comments detract away from what he's trying to get done. Earlier this week, he had a phenomenal meeting with bipartisan support mm -hmm. for the first time in a year since he got inaugurated in January. Uh, they were praising him publicly on microphones outside the White House to the media. Yeah. And here we are now just pulling all of that back as if it didn't happen. And so he has to realize that, yes, he says things uh, in a very candid way. Some of it might be true. Some might not be true. But it does serve as a distraction to his agenda and what his goals are. Well, and, and I don't know how genuine, uh, Juan, to further Katie's point, Democrats were when they said, oh, we could be close to getting a deal. I, I don't know how many of them would have eventually jumped on board. But this is a distraction. And, you know, I would question, and I hear you on private. I did not hear anybody say off the record, but I hear you on a private meeting. Okay. The, the complicating fact for me in that meeting is how low brow were the arguments such that these words were needed to make the argument? Well, let's, let's go true. back because what Good the point. reporting indicates is that they were having a conversation about this 
lottery, this diversity lottery. The visa lottery. And so what happens in that lottery, Harris, is that the U.S. government has determined that there are certain countries that are underrepresented in terms of the immigrant flow into the United States, legal immigrant flow. And in order to make sure that people from these less represented countries had an opportunity, they then started this lottery program. Mm -hmm. At that point, President Trump was saying he wants to cut that program. He really wants to eliminate, I think, but he says he's willing to cut it in half. And they were talking about, okay, if we're going to cut it in half, let's make sure that we have a special program to make sure that people from distressed countries, and here they were talking about African, Haitian, El Salvador. Mostly countries of people of color. Yes, and the president then apparently responded with this vulgarity saying why do we need people from those blank countries again speaking to what melissa pointed out there's a difference between the countries and corrupt government that was katie's Actually, point katie and said the, that. no and melissa said we need to speak to the spirit right. yeah. of the comment which is gosh answer the question what, that he had yeah because it should to, be right. it should be so obvious you know what mr president your family immigrated to this country. At that time, people spoke in those negative terms about, yeah. that's true. you know, other parts that's of the world. Point. And now you talk about this and the heavy load of the racial part, people from those countries being people, people of color, unlike people from as Norway. indentured servants from Ireland. Right. That's right. Yes. And, and who first went through the Caribbean, Barbados, where I was just a, a few weeks ago. The community, the Irish community, very proud, but they came yeah. as indentured servants and settled there. And some came to the upper northern, northeast and, part of this country as well. And where would we be if we didn't have these immigrants? I wouldn't people be here. From I, and my people, family is of Irish descent. And my husband's of Irish descent. And people who are from Ireland just look out here on St. Patrick's Day whose parents came, they're still very proud. So you can understand why Mia Love and other people felt very offended by the comment he made. That said, I still don't in my heart believe the president's a racist. I think he's just an old guy who says things in Ooh. a very impolitic way. And I think that sometimes being not being a politician has benefited him. This would have been a day where being a politician would have benefited him because mm. I think he says things in ways that just give more grist to the mill for but his... But does it affect yeah. the policy? See, it does. And I just talked to my husband about this. And, and we had a, we great, had a conversation. great conversation. Can we share a little bit of that green room yeah, conversation? Yeah. And Sean said, look, we were in a better place at the beginning of the week to get a deal. Right. Uh, there you go. Days ago you were yeah, in yeah. that place. That's, that's the real we point. are right now. And I'll tell you what. This is now being fought on the terms that the Democrats like, which is well, identity politics and the racialization whoa. of immigration Who, and border security. Wait a second. Who brought identity politics into this, Rachel? I think it was the president, not well, the Democrats. Mm, I, I would argue the Democrats who walked out of that like room it. and decided to repeat those words That's that right. were said. That's right. Those incendiary why remarks. Why did he say it then? And Democrats. No, 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 I'm not saying the origin just, of the okay. comment. You're asking right, the origin of the politics. And origin of the politics, to me, happens when you leave a private meeting and you, you, know, you don't share a transcript, no. which is very different than sharing just certain comments and remarks. The origin of the remarks, the president. The origin of That's the politics, the Democrats. Agreed. So then I ask the question again, because nobody answered. Uh, I'll go to you with it. What is incumbent upon the uh, Republicans in that room to do at this point? Anything? I don't know. I mean, I almost think that, that you have to come. I think you have to be honest about what, what you think you heard and what you heard. You do. Uh, I do. I mean, we can't be in a place where we're, where we're lying about anything. I mean, we've got to come forward, talk about what happened, talk about how to fix it. I mean, like I said, answer the actual question of why it is valuable to have people from these countries Agreed. Right. because Agreed. they make this a country. They appreciate being here. They work really hard. This is what our country is all about, taking people who are in horrible circumstances and giving them and their families the chance for something better. I think underneath that point is this idea that it is difficult to get people immigrating from a country that has a failed government, and he's con maybe confusing those topics where it's tough that. to vet people in terms of terror, but that's not... That's not what this with Haiti is about. So when I say I agree with you as a journalist, I'm in favor of more words, not fewer. So yeah. bringing forth whatever we know now that everything is leaked is helpful to maybe get us to that next point of talking. I mean, look at the kind of conversation you can have, and maybe they can get back to the point where they can do a deal. Mm -hmm. I don't know. January 19th, though, government mm -hmm. spending deadline. And this will be part of that conversation, no doubt. Democrats and Republicans at odds over how to move forward with congressional investigations on Russia now. Democrats reportedly want to hear from dozens of additional witnesses. We will talk about how long these investigations should go on and on and on. 
And the House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi is facing some backlash after some controversial remarks she made about the bipartisan group of lawmakers negotiating an immigration reform. Race came up out of her mouth. What she said that even has some members of her own political party firing back. Stay close. The very idea that this week they're saying, oh, why don't we get four white guys and, and General Kelly to come and do this. New developments in the congressional investigations into Russian interference in the 2016 election. Former White House Chief Strategist Steve Bannon reportedly set to appear before the House Intelligence Committee next week. Mr. Bannon made headlines for his comments in a new book calling that meeting at Trump Tower during the 2016 campaign treasonous. The top Democrat on the committee reportedly wants Bannon as well as dozens of other witnesses to testify. His wish list reportedly includes Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner. Former Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski is also expected to appear as early as next week. He reportedly said he will not plead the fifth. Meanwhile, in the Senate Intelligence Committee Chairman Richard Burr saying he sees no reason to ask Steve Bannon to appear before the committee. Katie, what do you think? I think it's interesting he's saying he doesn't want him to appear before the committee because we've heard the opposite from Democrats. And based on what Steve Bannon said in this book and in interviews about it wasn't just about slamming President Trump's family and that being a personal insult. It was the fact that he essentially implicated President Trump in the Russia scandal by saying he knew about the meeting that Don Jr. had at Trump Tower, which is something that the White House and the campaign has denied. So in terms of where this goes, we've heard both that it's wrapping up and that we don't know how long it's going to go. If this is the witness list, I think that we're going to be talking about this for a little while longer. Yeah. So when we look at the Russia probe, you see the Democrats want to talk about Trump and collusion, uh, but the Republicans want to talk about Hillary and collusion. And so I think we should look at both of them. If we're going to look at Trump and we're going to have all these witnesses, that's fine. Then let's keep talking about the emails. Let's keep talking about the speech that Bill Clinton gave. Let's keep talking about Uranium One and emails that probably the Russians saw from her server. And let's just keep going. If that's what the Democrats want to do, fine. But we, what, what I don't like is to see um, a politicization of the Russia uh, topic. There were, there, if there's a Russia probe, let's look at, and, and Russia interfered yeah. with our elections, okay, let's look at what happened on both sides. And to me, I, I think, you know, part of the reason why you see Bannon and even Lewandowski saying, go ahead, talk to me, I don't think there's any collusion there, because if there was, with all the leaks we've had, we would have right. known by now. It, it seems clear to me that, that Russia's attempted to get its fingers into absolutely everything that's going on. Um, it, it is curious why we investigate one side and not the other, or is it possible to look at all of these various things? And I, I, I'm never satisfied we have these hearings anyway, because it doesn't seem like we make any progress. People kind of grandstand, they say things, you feel like you learned something, then nothing ever comes of it. Even if you feel like you heard somebody said something that, that incriminated them, then there's no follow-up. I don't know, is it frustrating to you? Well, I think what's frustrating is understanding the impact, you know, when the Trump folks go on the offensive and they attack the credibility of law enforcement, attack the FBI, attack Robert Mueller, say that Jeff Sessions, your own attorney general, isn't doing enough. You know, I think the president said this week he wants Republicans to take control of the Russia investigation. I mean, it looks like it's the people who are conducting the Russia investigation are just simply seeking to undermine him and that it's all political, you know, going back to what Rachel was talking about. To the contrary... What we've seen is a steady progression by Robert Mueller's special counsel. We've seen people indicted. We see now Bannon making these statements about not only treason, but suggesting that there's money laundering involved in the rest. And we see that the special counsel uh, says that he is making steady progress. So I, to me, it's like, you know what, the impact of all the Trump people saying, oh, it's, it's not Trump, don't, don't look for anything here, it's, look, look the other way, look at the Clintons. Is Wait, really having you impact on the you you well, If, I, if okay. I could, I mean, we can actually do three things at once. Sure. You can, you can look at the current investigation and the Trump side of it. You can look at the next investigation and the Clinton side of it. Yeah. But the criticism about law enforcement, I want that to be looked at too from this vein. Was there bias at the FBI? Was there bias at the DOJ? I want them to look at sure. those men, and in the case of the FBI, FBI men and one woman, uh, and the text messages that were exchanged. I, take a look at that.
that. And, and was there any furthering of that mentality there? And what was the insurance policy that Peter Strzok and this woman said that they, you know, agreed upon to keep the president well, out of remember, the White House? Let me remember. finish. I didn't talk when you talked. No, no, no. Hold but on one second. So I, I, want, I want all of that to be looked at from the standpoint that America deserves to have its trust renewed right. in these agencies that are tasked with not only keeping us informed, but keeping us safe. So I think you must remember the Democrats complained when Jim Comey came out with his statement uh, about Hillary Clinton, not indicting her. I do, her, but when it was time to secondly, fire him, then they were disingenuous and well, only no, keep him in I office. I don't think so. No, no, no. I think people <laughs> were still critical of him. They said this is the president of the United States who's exercising his power to fire somebody who had a contrary view of what was going on with the Russians. But the key point here is okay. what we're talking about with the Clintons or the uh, questions about text messages from FBI agents doesn't match the, uh, the magnitude of the threat posed by the Russians interfering That's in our it, politics. But it does oh, no, speak I think to it the does issue of uranium. The, yeah, well, yeah, and, and the issue of them bigger. being able to do their jobs without bias, I think, is important. And that's not to impugn no. all the thousands of people who work there. But if we're investigating, let's look at the ones that we know were perhaps tipping more than okay. toe into the bias end of things. All right, the immigration debate raging on, just in case you haven't noticed. Now President <laughs> Trump slamming a bipartisan deal proposed by Senate lawmakers what this means going forward and whether Democrats will force a government shutdown if Congress fails to strike a deal in one week. Plus, Nancy Pelosi's controversial comment on the group working on that deal. Did she cross a line? We're going to debate that next. Fox's alert, at least one bipartisan group of senators is going back to the drawing board after President Trump slammed their proposal to provide protections for dreamers and to reform parts of the immigration system. The president tweeted this, the so-called bipartisan DACA deal presented yesterday to myself and a group of Republican senators and congressmen was a big step backward. Wall was not properly funded, chain and lottery were made worse, and the U.S. would be forced to take large numbers of people from high crime countries, which are doing badly. And this, because of the Democrats not being interested in life and safety, DACA has now uh, taken a big step backwards. The Dems will threaten shutdown, but what they are really doing is shutting down our military at a time when we need it most. Get smart, make America great again. That's not the only immigration deal in the works, though. There are other groups in the House and Senate trying to come up with an agreement as well. But where does this leave us? So you had that, that one, uh, Rachel, that the four um, congressman and one woman who came up with the House version of this led by Bob Goodlatte. So you've got that out there and you've got these ideas on the Senate side, which the president says he doesn't like. Right. And the, the people who were in his office yesterday when he made this, you know, unfortunate comment and he was upset about the deal they put forward. I mean, let's remember, these are not leadership appointed um, groups of senators. These are self-appointed groups. And I, you know, I talked to several uh, people in the House and nobody liked that deal either. The president said no deal and these congressmen were going to say no deal. I, I hope we get a deal, but I will say that we were better off getting a deal earlier in the week than we are right now. <laughs> so let me ask this, because when you watch that, that really remarkable 55-minute live inside yeah. look. It's amazing. Uh, it was really, really interesting earlier this week, and you got to see Democrats and Republicans. I remember at one point, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was Dianne Feinstein of California who said, you know, can we talk about a clean DACA bill and separate that out from the spending bill? Now, remember, Democrat putting that on right. the table. The president said, well, I, I, we can talk about that. So why not try to get it done that way and keep the government open as of next Friday? Well, because think... remember, Kevin McCarthy stepped in at just that moment, Harris, and said, getting... uh, Mr. President, yeah. slow down. You're that's not rolled. to our advantage on the Republican no, side. No, he we wanted want... the wall to come back into right. play. Yeah, and a few that's, other that's what, so we got to tie everything in. But he didn't say it couldn't in. happen without certain other things on board, Katie. Feinstein was making the argument not necessarily to take it out of the spending bill because that would take away the leverage from Democrats right. in this situation. She was saying she wanted a clean DACA bill away from the other requirements that the White House and Republicans want, meaning chain migration ending, visa lottery program ending, and the wall. That's what she meant Those by, things in the by 
right. she, like she just yeah. wanted the DACA program to be fixed. Right. But this was the first bite of the apple for the framework of, of getting something yeah. on the table. However, they don't have a lot of time because Democrats have decided to tie it to the spending bill. And they're going to have to make the decision about whether they're going to put DACA recipients or the U.S. military first. And I think Americans know exactly which well, one come they on. should that's, But that's a false choice because then who but wouldn't take it? Who it's wouldn't support not. our military? So, you, you, I mean, you put us in a box. But what I'm saying is it because seems they're putting to me, themselves in a box no, by, because this was, by putting it at this deadline. Democrats were, no, were asking but remember, for it the to deadline, be tied to the spending the bill. The president has said that he really wants to support the Dreamers. And he said, right. you, know, you know, but the plan, the plan was supposed to, by to end bill. in March. He created an artificial crisis when he undid it in the fall. And no, said, Obama We've created got an artificial crisis. A couple okay. things, because I want to bring you into the conversation on this, Melissa. A couple <laughs> things. So the judge recently ruled uh, from the Ninth Circuit uh, that, you know, he's going to take a relook at this and he's going to keep the program for Dreamers in place, mm -hmm. defying what the White House had wanted. He's going to keep it in place until either Congress comes up with a solution or he looks at it, which, and looking at his docket, that would be as far along as, as June. So there is a little bit more time to deal with this. Democrats are not being uh, genuine, right. or genuine rather, when they say it has to be done right now because mm -hmm. that judge created some space. There is more time to deal with it, with, but the problem is it's actually not nice to people to continue having this out here and expiring and expiring no, and going true. on. Yeah. Like when you talk about continuing it and he's so mean to rip it away, it's mean to not come up with a permanent solution as to what we're actually going to do. I mean, rather than politicking, it would be so nice if people could sit down like adults, which is what that room looks like. I mean, it that's, did. to me, that's, that, that's what makes me want to cry, is that when you watch that room, Democrats were working, everybody was working. The 55-minute live yes, meeting. Okay. I sincerely believe, having watched the whole thing live and organically it was as it was happening, which is different from watching it with everybody's spin, watching it organically as I was happening, I felt like it was dawning on everyone that they could actually get something done. Yes. yes. And that they could put politics aside and be like, you know what, the truth is, I could live with this and this if I could have this. Where in politics you have to say, I, there's no way I'm going to let that happen. I Katie, do you think the camera makes really people live with. act better? Absolutely. I mean, when the president said yes. on Twitter that what do I need to do, have everything recorded at this point? Yeah. You know, th does, does, that he should. does that have everybody dial it up does, their better answers? You know what it does? It makes sure that there is accountability. That's when right. there is accountability for what people say and what their actions are, they tend to speak a little more civilly because they know there will be consequences for what they Y'all tease me, but that's why I like C-SPAN. It can that's cause true. We, like, we all like C-SPAN. So. You know, but you remember, it was sometimes. Republicans who were flipping out at what he said in that meeting. Yeah. So, I mean, no, the I question think he is, misunderstood what well, she said. I don't know if he understood. You didn't, you didn't get what it was. He right. always anyway. wants the wall. Well, anyway, <laughs> well, moving along. But I would say one last thing on this point before I know we want to move along is that did he mean a wall literally from the Democrats' perspective or did he mean it as a rhetorical no, he device he used system. during the case? A wall, wall system. Meaning you put a fence line wall in where it makes sense. You well, don't put it but in. I'm you saying, can't but put it in. You can't build it in a river. And we're going to put a wall on this topic. And we're going to move right along. Okay, we got it. That was a big shift, Juan. You're right. So, going forward, it went over <laughs> like a lead balloon. Nancy Pelosi's dig aimed at a group of lawmakers negotiating an immigration deal. And even when fellow Democrats are upset about it, you know it's a problem. Here's the remarks that kicked off the controversy. Five white guys, I call them, you know. Um, <laughs> I said, they going to open a hamburger stand next or what? Um, the, um, <laughs> the... That could have been done four months ago. The very idea that this week they're saying, oh, why don't we get four white guys and, and General Kelly to come and do this? You have to understand, in our caucus, we are blessed with great diversity. To ignore all of that and say, well, four of us are going to go in a room with General Kelly and we're going to come up with something. Well, they could have done that four months ago. Well, that getting an immediate pushback from Pelosi's number two, Steny Hoyer. He says in a statement obtained by Politico, quote, that comment is offensive. I am committed to ensuring dreamers are protected, and I will welcome everyone to the table who wants to get this done. Pelosi's office releasing a statement appearing to walk back from the controversy, saying, quote, it's not a question of who's there, but who's not there. Juan, how do Nancy Pelosi's comments move the ball forward in terms of any kind of deal on DACA, which are people that Democrats claim to care about? Oh, I think that, remember, that's so important for the members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. 
uh, to feel like they have some input into these negotiations. And so I think they've been pressuring Pelosi to say, hey, how come you have a, a group of only white men in the meeting, in her case, represented by Hoyer? So Hoyer's right to say, hey, if it's about my whiteness, that's offensive because I really care about this issue. Right. But yeah. in terms of your point, Katie, moving us forward, mm -hmm. I think you have, you're going to have to have a deal where you hear from divergent communities, especially those directly affected. Well, Harris, isn't well, there a well, double what? standard with that, with well, the comment she made about white guys just getting mm -hmm. together when they're trying to solve a problem? Well, I mean, it, it doesn't elevate the conversation. Conversation. No. I've said that about her many times, though. And, and look, I don't have to make any points on that. When you did have a Latino crowd around her talking DACA and Dreamers, and they were young people in the audience with their phones uh, calling her a liar and, and bum-rushing the lectern where she was speaking from, it isn't that you know diver diverse audiences haven't been sought out or, or talked to by this particular Democrat, um, but they are hostile toward her because they don't think that she really has, her ba has their back. Well, well, I, they, you know, I was wait. just going to say, I, I don't believe that when it comes to either the dreamers or even comprehensive immigration reform um, what I see is that I don't think the Democrats want to deal I think they love having this club yep. to hit Republicans with and I think their biggest fear was what happened earlier in the week which is why I, I'm upset that the president stepped on this Wait. is that he it, earlier in the week I think he had the, the conversation where it should be about border security and a solution for the dreamers and guess what he even alluded to potentially solving mm -hmm. co comprehensive okay. immigration reform which which would have taken immigration off I just the table, see, which was negative for the Democrats. I know we have to go out to say something really quick. It's really offensive when anyone says four white guys, five white guys. You don't get to flip it around and do it that way as well. It, it doesn't mean just because those men are white that they can't represent, that they haven't talked to, and they can't represent the needs of others. I don't like it. I mean, now in this era, I was writing a recommendation for someone the other day who was a woman and said at a time when we're putting women forward, that is not why you should promote this person. She's the most qualified person. I don't like this as we yeah. sit here and put labels on people. Okay. All right, well, we are waiting President Trump's decision on the Iran nuclear deal. Sources tell Fox News he will likely continue decertification but keep sanction waivers in place, whether he needs to get tougher. House Speaker Paul Ryan right now is at a live event in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Moments ago, he was asked about the president's controversial remarks. Here's what the speaker had to say. Yeah, I, I read those comments later last night. Uh, so first thing that came to my mind was very unfortunate, um, unhelpful. Um, but you know what I thought of right away? You know, it's interesting. Uh, Rachel was just saying this is what politicians are going to have to talk about inside the GOP today. Yeah, instead of talking about 44-year low unemployment, um, record, uh, uh, record job numbers for Hispanics, uh, you know, a renaissance in manufacturing, stock market. I mean, this economy is absolutely booming, and we have to talk about this. This is the problem. Yeah. All right. Katie? All right, well, Fox News alert. We are awaiting a decision from President Trump. On the Iranian nuclear deal, sources telling Fox News he is likely to continue decertification of the deal and that he is also likely to reluctantly continue sanctions waivers while imposing new sanctions on the government that are separate from the nuclear deal. Here's White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders on the ongoing review process. The president still uh, strongly believes this is one of the worst deals of all time. Uh, and one of the single greatest flaws is that its restrictions leave Iran free in the future to openly develop their nuclear program and rapidly achieve a nuclear weapons breakout capability. Uh, obviously, we see uh, big problems with that. The administration is continuing to work with Congress and with our allies to address those flaws. Uh, and we'll keep you guys posted. Well, so the administration's in a tough place. Yeah. Uh, they seem to want to impose more sanctions. Can you tell us what that means for business in Iran? I mean, what's so interesting is I heard a really good reporter on our network breaking it down this morning and saying that by staying in the deal and continuing to waive the sanctions that are within the deal, that then the president can just step outside the deal and impose all kinds of other sanctions on Iran, which makes me wonder if this deal is even more stupid than I thought in the first place. <laughs> I mean, how is that possible? 
I mean, it's, it, it has felt meaningless because it has felt like everybody came together on a deal. You know, Europe thought they were going to rush into the country and make a fortune, and their economies were sagging. They were excited to sell iPhones and Diet Coke to folks, and there that hasn't happened. Um, you know, they were going to slow down the nuclear program. Doesn't seem like that's happened. Nothing has been advanced. We haven't gotten any leverage. And things aren't better. But then also. We're imposing these. We're not imposing sanctions, but we can step right outside and impose different sanctions. It's. It seems like it's all nonsense. Juan, well, what, one thing has happened for sure, and that's all the money that they got in this deal, mm, right. and well, the people that, in the right? streets of Iran saying that that money has been used outside of the things that they say they need. I right. mean, they want a booming economy and millions and millions of dollars. And we knew potentially from former Secretary John Kerry that they would take that money and pump it into, you know, the the tributaries of terrorism. Mm -hmm. uh, so the people on the ground are telling us how faulty that deal was, also from their perspective. Well, and based on Iran's behavior since nuclear deal was signed, whether whether it's buzzing our ships in the Persian Gulf, or whether it's you know not giving the money that we sent back to them to the people, and instead funneling it to terrorist organizations in Yemen, for example, who are shooting rockets and missiles at civilian airports. I mean, what is the justification for staying in this deal at this point, based on Iran's behavior? Well, I think the key point is it was supposed to limit their ability to develop nuclear weapons that they would use against Israel. So we had a strong interest in that, and I would expand that into the whole Middle East region, Kate. But so now you have a situation where people are saying, if you impose these sanctions, you're changing the deal. And what that means is less in consequence. But has Iran not changed the deal through their behavior? Well, but what I'm saying to you is the Europeans, uh, Western Europeans, but even some in the UN Security Council and others have said, we want this deal because we want to take away the power to develop nuclear weapons from Iran. We can have arguments about sanctions and what the money got used for, but we should not lose focus on what we're doing. That's the problem. Rachel, the argument from the administration is we don't have evidence necessarily that they violated the nuclear agreement, but we do believe that they have violated the spirit of the deal and all of the behavior around the deal is what we're trying to combat here. Right. Look, they're still building ballistic missiles. They're still funding terrorism. They're committing human rights abuses against their own people here right now. Um, so I don't think anything has changed in Iran's behavior since we, you know, pass uh, this the, these sanctions. So I mean, I don't. I know the president ran on we're going to end this agreement. I don't think the American people care whether that we stay in the agreement or add more sanctions. It doesn't seem to do anything. I, it doesn't seem. And what I think people want is them to stop threatening uh, uh, Israel and to stop building uh, nuclear weapons. And I think they also that we should be doing some things to help the protesters, the protesters and right. give support. Which have been forgotten a little bit. All right. Absolutely. A new study finds the mainstream media devoting wall-to-wall -wall coverage to the anti-Trump book while downplaying stories like the new Clinton Foundation probe. Wait to see how the media coverage broke down. That's next. New analysis of recent press coverage of President Trump. A media research center study found that in the first week of the year, the big three broadcast networks stuffed their evening and morning news programs with over two hours of coverage of the anti-Trump book, but devoted just 11 minutes to the new Clinton Foundation probe and just over five minutes to the Dow Jones breaking the 25,000 mark. As it continues, its record surge under President Trump. And as you see here, the Dow hitting yet another record high today. So, Melissa, yeah. I mean, this is big business news. Yeah. Uh, can you imagine this happening under the Obama administration? These kinds of record numbers, these kinds of record breaking unemployment yeah. numbers, et cetera. And it getting this scant of coverage under Obama? Well, you know, I mean, it's interesting because I feel like business and economics and those sort of things, that, that's how people vote. That's how they feel. That's what they care about. That's what you know is impacting you. Not necessarily, and I, I, I'm on a business channel, so I hate to say this, not always what you want to watch. I mean, people like the popcorn and the salacious nature sure. of things. So the gossipy book, I can see that. 
Um, I just, it, you know, it's interesting. It's just to me in this world, everybody's getting so deep into their own echo chamber, and nothing that happens changes anyone's mind. It just reinforces the opinion that you have, and you watch, you know, sort of the program that's going to give you what you already think. And it, it's kind of a strange, strange place to be. Juan's laughing. Well, it's, it's so true. So true. You know, people yeah. watch because they want their pre-existing views affirmed Reinforce, rather than yeah. getting information. I'm always grateful that people are willing to listen to a contrary point of view, given what I do here. So, no. I <laughs> We're grateful for you, too, Juan, for audience, providing. Right? We're uh, grateful to you for providing. Well, no, but I'm saying, <laughs> you know, it's so interesting because I thought what you said is right. The salacious material is always going to get attention. Yeah. But it, the fact is, when you have people like Steve Bannon, who is a Trump right. acolyte, right in there saying horrible things, it's going to get some attention. Well, well, I, I, I yeah. was to say, I remember when Obama had, when President Obama had his recovery summer. Remember mm -hmm. that? And it was a big Which dud. one? There were yeah, seven there of was them. A, yeah, and n it never happened. And I can't imagine if that had happened to Donald Trump, you know, yeah. that we, that he wouldn't be mocked over that. Well, so another network is saying that under Obama, there wasn't much to cover, and there's just so much more exactly. to cover under Trump. <laughs> and it might be true that the Trump administration moves at a faster pace, but in terms of scandals and what was happening and the salacious, salacious nature of what happened under the Obama administration, there were plenty of scandals well, to go around. But yeah. I just want to make this point about the book. Although the networks covered the Wolf book by far more than they did the economy, I do think yeah. that's a problem. However, when you have the White House involved, you have the White House talking about the book, the president tweeting about the book, right. and the White House firing someone over the book and then releasing that hot fire statement about <laughs> Steve Bannon, yeah. that is news that can't necessarily be it's ignored. True. And, I, I mean, he's driving it, he knows it, he is a media guy, none of that is a surprise. Right. I mean, and I think that, that the way this administration operates is intentional. Well, and, as, and you can make the argument, which has been made, that while the media is focused on the drama of D.C., the president's actually getting things done, like yes. stacking the courts full of conservative